Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program today. My name is Lisa Levinson, and I am the Campaigns Director for In Defense of Animals, and we are thrilled to present this special program to, to you all for Activist Appreciation Month. This is our time at IDA when we honor your activism. And we do that through these programs and we have special activist spotlights and blogs and even an alert all prepped for you for this month. And our theme for Activist Appreciation Month this year is animal rescue. So those of us who do animal rescue know that it sometimes takes a toll on our mental, emotional, and spiritual selves. And for that reason, we've invited um, Dr. Paul White, who is a vegan therapist, to speak with us today. And I'm really honored to introduce him to you now. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, by the way, you may not, uh, may not see her today, but I do have a a supervisor, a clinical supervisor, right over in the corner. Her name is Jazzy. She's a torty cat, and she knows what she's talking about. So the way we're well uh, grounded with her presence. <laughs> um, so I'm like, uh, again, thanks, Lisa. I'm Dr. Paul White. I've got a, uh, got a PhD in mind body medicine, but I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in California and in Maryland, that's where I hold the licenses, but I work with people worldwide, especially as it in regards to them managing their uh, uh, <clears throat> certainly like vicarious trauma around their activism. And as much as I've been involved directly with uh, various levels of animal rights activism, um, I certainly feel particularly encouraged by uh, by the skills and experiences I've gleaned to to lend a hand in that in that arena to uh support the mental health to support the mental health of of activists um it's really is a pleasure to be here and uh <clears throat> i think most importantly just feeling humble that the acknowledgement by by lisa and in defense of animals the organization and the myriad of ways i've been in contact with the with ida over uh it's like four almost five years now so pretty good stuff um <clears throat> today I, I believe we're going to in particular look at a series of questions that i've i've gathered from animal rights activists that have come to my have come to my practice to get some additional help and support it's feeling like grounded and so i've accumulated about 10 questions and it's all in my I've got a little ebook going on, and it's linked through the IDA website. It's linked through my website, which I can certainly share with you later if you don't have that. Um, and again, yeah, just a series of ten of the most common questions that I've received in the mental health field to help people, to help vegan activists who are trying to manage everything from, like I said, the vicarious trauma of being on the front line to uh, deal with family members or the general public who are often quite dismissive, if not outright rude, and uh, sometimes do their very best to re-traumatize us and uh, serving all those things and communication techniques can help really set us up in a place where we feel more calm in our body and not so driven far from the, uh, or deep into the thoughts, the catastrophic thinking that we could fall into, the black and white thinking that is all too easy when we're experiencing these, uh, I mean, honestly, depressive episodes, uh, the traumatic experiences we live in those, and uh, deep sense of anxiety about uh, all these things that are happening in the, in the realm of activism and just trying to be the best humans we possibly can be as far as as far as it's practical and possible, right? That's some of the key phrasing, and it's taken us quite a long ways. Um, <clears throat> so as we continue, let's see. I think uh, we can kind of just 
jump in with the little back and forth with either either questions that you have. They're more than more than welcome to ask them as we go along. And I believe uh, Lisa and I will also have a bit of back and forth. But essentially, I'll help uh, lay out some of the uh, some of the questions and the answers that I have in that ebook. Um, so. Yeah, until we get some questions rolling, I can check this out. And so the first one of the first questions I, I generally get is something along the lines of, so how can I manage my feelings after seeing and thinking about animal suffering without feeling myself like that overwhelm? I mean, yeah, and that is a very common one, I think that the sentiment behind that particular question can certainly span span a number of areas. But uh, when it comes to what witnessing our very own, uh, the suffering of animals, it really can feel like quite a heavy cloud of it's just kind of settling on us, like holding us down, um, casting like almost like long shadows of, of sadness and darkness over our hearts and souls, if you will. And it really is natural to want to turn and run away and like shield yourself out of protection uh, from that, uh, from almost like that, the darkness, that storm that's trying to envelop us. But there is in fact quite a lot of beauty when it comes to these things. And the beauty comes from learning how to activate and access your inner strength and to learn, learn to move and flow with the, with the darkness and with the rain. So that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't drown us, but it washes over. Um, so carrying, so when it washes over, it kind of carry away that sadness, that uh, it's just a really heavy feeling. Uh, <clears throat> and in this realm, when I, when I mentioned earlier that I have a doctorate in mind body medicine, that is very. Uh, somatic oriented, like understanding what's happening in the body and how that influences the mind and vice versa, what's happening in the mind and how that influences the body. Um, so when things like this happen, we're trying to manage the the overwhelm of, of the suffering animals. Um, we can tap back into our bodies because it's the mind that really takes us into those dark places and it is harder than ever to to let go of what the mind has to say and even harder than that is is not is knowing that you don't have to believe the thoughts that are happening upstairs um and so when the uh the mind body part comes in is understanding what's happening internally like physically to to the body so when it comes to understanding the how heavy these things are sometimes i could feel like it's sitting on your shoulders um, and that is a uh, very oppressive even. And so with that information, what we can do is look at the, uh, my first tip for that particular question. I mean, a lot of these are universally uh, applicable, but is to do a grounding practice. Uh, and grounding practices can come in all shapes and sizes, but in particular for this one, we just do the grounding with the five, the five senses. And that's your sight, your sun, your hearing, your touch, your taste, and your smell. And so what I mean by that, just walking through, is once you feel that overwhelm, you look, uh, first we're looking at the sight. We're going to look around us. We're going to identify five things we can see in our immediate vicinity. You could label them, but not really attaching them. We're just being grounded ourselves in the present. So... Take a look at five things you could label. Like I've got a lamp, a cup, a desk, a mirror, a book, computer. And so there. And then you move down to hearing. So you list four things nearby that you can hear. So I can hear various things in my environment, which are uh, the road outside. I can hear, I can hear Jazzy. She snores. <laughs> um, I can hear my your fan anyway so four things you can hear three things that you can touch in your immediate environment again whatever's nearby just to put you back in a place 
One of mine is an apple and a nice cool gem. Three things you touch, four things. Sorry, taste. Moving on taste. So that's two things you can taste. Uh, maybe a recent meal that you had, a delicious vegan tofu curry, which is which was my lunch. Thank you, me. <laughs> um, and smell. One thing that you can smell in your surroundings. And I have got a lovely hinoki tree oil, essential oil, just kind of wafted in the air. So that's beautiful. <clears throat> um, so yeah, that's a really general starting point for trying to get yourself back to a grounded place and feeling safe in your body, which is key. Like I said, there are various ways to to feel grounded. Um, so yeah, and just a little journey through the senses. Okay. Uh, let me take a quick peep into the questions. Play, share, questions on it. <laughs> Uh, yes. I can help guide some of the questions if you'd like. Um, we can also go through some of the practices and then um, do some some of the questions afterwards. Okay. But we do have a couple that we can start with. So one of them is um, how to get rid of psychotic flashbacks. How to get rid of psychotic flashbacks? Is that, was that the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, uh, I don't know exactly what a psychotic flashback is. What it sounds like to me is, uh, it's kind of like what that first question that I brought up was the, uh, like the animal suffering and PTSD in particular, or even uh, CPT CPTSD is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. How to get rid of those. Oh boy. How much time do we have? <laughs> That is, a, that is a deep question. Uh, essentially, given our time frame, what I would certainly recommend is more and more regular practice. Uh, first of all, okay, first off, ensuring that you have professional guidance, like a one-on-one -on -one, um, professional, like a mental health trauma counselor, which will be crucial in, in navigating these these waters because it's uh, that is a, a deeply impactful experience to have and especially if you're re-traumatized by those. Um, but until we're in the midst of uh, of having like a trauma therapist, um, regularly practicing something that will help you ground yourself. Because like what I was saying before, especially when we have those types of flashbacks, um, it's the mind that's, that's pulling us into that place and reliving those experiences and so because the mind is having those experiences and, and creating these images for you, these very terrific, yeah, the terrific, horrific images, um, it's hard not to believe those and just kind of fall into the natural conclusion. And and because your mind is going there, the, the body's like taking note because the body's down here like, what's going on up there, mind? And the mind's like, we've got to freak out. We've got to be, we've got to be safe. And the body's like, oh my gosh, we've got to be safe. Let's run away or we're going to freeze or pass out or whatever. So we bypass the mind for just a moment. And that's what the grounding does is puts us back in our bodies, helps us feel safe and anchored in the moment. And it gets us through to the next. So that's about as brief as I can make it. And yeah, thoughts? Avoiding overexposure, absolutely. I honestly, my sometimes I hesitate to open my, my Instagram because I got a lot of that in there for good reason. But it's like, um, I'm going to see some things as soon as I open this. So I have to be, I have to ground myself before I even go in. And sometimes that looks like just, I will count myself down, like do a five to one. And you could do it with me too. Just go five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I can do this. And then you step in and be aware of your boundaries around that. Could be um, just in there long enough to, uh, to do what you need to do and hop back out and then breathe again, count again, go do something, go look at some trees. But grounding is crucial.
Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so did you want to continue with any of the practices? Then we can come back to some more of the questions. Sure. Um, the, uh, Thank you. So we can talk about what it looks like to kind of change gears a little bit and look at uh, communicating. Because um, that can really trigger things when when we're going out to uh, people's houses for, for meals and and they know and we know what well we know what our boundaries are and if we kind of perceive any potential issue with that it's like we either have to eat ahead of time plan some snacks or <clears throat> bring our own meals all together and then we're faced with those people who are like i don't care why it's such a big deal i it's a personal choice i could eat these i could eat whatever i want well first of all it's not what you want to eat it's it's who you want to eat so again even i can be a little sensitive <laughs> So when it comes to that, got the grounding practices and then the communication piece, which is, in this case, I'll talk about active listening, but active listening in a very compassionate and vegan way. Um, step one, ground yourself. Feel calm in your body in whatever practice that looks like for you. Um, that is... Uh, Breathing is my favorite. It's the go-to. It really can activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the one that, that dictates how, how calm the body is. And step two, you really want to like tune in to what's being what's being said, what's being shared, your thoughts and feelings. And when someone else speaks, create enough distance between you and the the actual topic of how quickly we can get triggered by someone's dismissal and just listen to their message to their to the thoughts and understand what the feeling is behind their thoughts so in the same way you give focus to i don't know deciphering a brand new uh vegan recipe like like the uh the korean vegan have you got her stuff it's amazing but can be quite detailed so really tune into that Listen to what they're saying. Part three is uh, taking a pause. So before before you respond, you're, you're going to continue to breathe throughout this and even ground yourself. So once they've finished what they have to say, and they give you a moment, you're going to pause. Just let it sit there for a second, kind of marinate in that, and and this shows that you have that you value what they need to share, what they want to share. Uh, four is like reflecting on uh, on the valid, uh, reflecting and validating the person's understanding. So if they say something like, um, I don't feel like I'm being respected when, when whatever's going on, when I, when I have to think about what I need, what I can eat. And so you, you pick up on exactly what they're, what the emotion behind that is and uh, <clears throat> saying, I can see that you don't feel understood and that's frustrating. So as much as you can identify the emotion that they're experiencing and, and just repeat it back to them. And if for some reason you can't identify their emotion, simply repeat back exactly what you heard them say. So I heard you say that, uh, that you don't like having to think about what you can and cannot eat. I understand. Step five, now it's your turn. Share your experience. Now it's your moment to speak your truth, speak your story in a way that's uh, not about converting the other people, but as tapping into that deep sense of empathy that we we all have. Sometimes we don't want to share it because it's, it just can be so much to sit with. It's really about connecting, connecting with the, the human in front of you. Now, Everything we share doesn't have to be like amazing and rev revelatory. Um, just a matter of, I understand the feelings you have. I have very similar feelings, and this is why I feel that way. And finally, when you get there, finding the rhythm in the conversations. And sometimes conversations can feel like a, like a composition or, or like a duet or something. So it's perfectly okay to celebrate the when the harmony happens and there's like a true and respectful back and forth 
within the conversation so that clarity, so that empathy can be invoked on both sides, on all sides. Yeah, that's a tough one though. It's uh, can be quite quite a bit harder than uh, harder to do than to than to say, but um, but we get through it, don't we? Yeah. So we do have a few other questions. Sure. That we can go through if you'd like. Um, one of them relates to the communication exercise that you just Ooh, okay. shared. And um, it was about how to um, find more empathy for other humans. <laughs> the question says, how do I get my misanthropy meter out of the red zone? Um, more and more, I find myself having oh, I love that. empathy for humans. Yeah. How do you get your, I think I'm going to have to use that, your misanthropy out of the red zone. Uh, I would try this. Uh, I'm glad you use that. I'm getting a bunch of imagery that pops up because the mind does play a crucial role in this too, in addition to the body, of course. Try to get an image of what that what that red zone looks like. Uh, you could like maybe draw an image of it like, uh, I don't know, see like, like battery meters will have one side is red, the other side's like blue or and then the middle is green, it's good to go and stuff like that. Uh, get an image of what what such a meter would look like, okay? Um, and once you have that image in your mind, create some kind of control device, like a dial underneath it. So if we have the meter that's running all the way to the red, visualize a dial to that meter, right? And now see yourself, recognize that it's in the red, and notice what feelings that brings up because it is in the red. It's so high. I just don't want to be around any humans like whatsoever. And I don't blame you sometimes. Okay. See the visual of the dial. See the meter. Take a nice, long, deep breath in. And when you do that, I want you to reach out, grab the dial in your mind, and start slowly turning it back down out of the red as you exhale. Ready? We'll do that again. Breathe in. See the dial. Start turning slowly as you exhale. Oh. And then step back. Continue to breathe and reassess. Take another look at the dial. See how much, if at all, it has moved. And then you repeat. Take a breath in. See the dial. Reach out, exhale, turn down some more. And you're back to yourself. And you know what? Honestly, it's only going to move as much as you need or want it to move. Sometimes it may be um, 0.01% of a fraction smaller than what it was. But that is still movement. There's a high possibility that's going to drop a little lower within the red area. Maybe it'll fall into neutral territory. But whatever the change is, is exactly what you needed in that moment to get you through to the next breath, to get you through the next day. So that's that's one way I would approach this, uh, that particular question. That is a great question, too. Yeah, thank you so much for addressing that question. Um, we do have another one that is kind of related. It is related to processing our anger that we've been manipulated and lied to for so long by governments and animal agriculture and the food industry. And the person who asked the question says, if I knew then what I know now, I would have been vegan a long time ago. I'm angry that I wasn't taught about this in school as a child, what was really going on in the dairy and meat industries, and angry that the misinformation that goes on today by educational institutions, and that this type of conditioning or brainwashing is allowed to continue. 
yeah, talk about systematic levels of oppression and historical uh, the historical depth underlying that. Uh, what I hear here in this question is so much of what uh, I've kind of already spoken about. So let me give you another tip on what it looks like to access a sense of emotional regulation, which is a component of grounding. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to anger, that can generally be quite an intense experience. Uh, again, because it's laden with all these historical issues uh, systematically uh, and thoroughly uh, kind of oppressing us and pressing information for so long. So it's going to have to start with us, and in particular with anger. Um, let me walk you briefly through a body scan. And this and body scans are designed to help you understand exactly where in your body you're experiencing the emotion. And once you have an idea of that, the more able you're going to be able to control or manage uh, and regulate that emotion. So foundationally, when it comes to a body scan, <clears throat> what you are simply going to do is just find a quiet place where you're not going to be disturbed. Somewhere, uh, somewhere comfortable. You could do it sit, uh, sitting down. You do it laying down. It could be pretty much anywhere as long as, again, you can feel safe. And that's what the crucial piece is, the feeling safety. And <clears throat> one place I like to start is in the feet. So right now, I'd like you to pay attention to what's happening in your feet, whether you're wearing shoes or socks or barefoot. Just notice what's happening in your feet, because that's where it all begins, in your feet. Once you have a feeling of what's happening in your feet, um, maybe the, you can feel the cloth on your feet or the, uh, or the floor below your bare feet, or the shoes, maybe they're restricting in certain parts of the foot. Just notice, we're not trying to change anything about that. We're simply noticing where that is. And I'm going to move up the body, move up the body into the ankles, into the, the calves and the shins and the thighs. And again, we're simply noticing what's happening in the lower portion of the body. Uh, noticing how the, the clothing is touching your calves, touching your thighs. Noticing how the uh, surface below you, like sitting in a chair, how that's influencing your uh, your lower legs. The temperature variation, um, like right now, my, uh, my feet are cold because they, well, I don't have shoes on. <laughs> and my, my legs are warmer with my pants and I can feel the pressure of the chair below, below my legs. And we continue to move up around the abdomen and the lower back, noticing what's happening there. There might be some discomfort. There might be some coolness or relaxation. There might be tension as well. Simply recognizing what's happening in the body. We're not trying to change anything about that experience. But we're continuing up the body, around the upper chest, and the back in between the shoulder blades, just very restfully with an open and curious mind, looking, exploring, and just being conscientious of the various experiences of each of the muscle groups to continue to scan the body. Going up further around the shoulders, you can go down one arm at a time as you go around the shoulders, and going down one arm, just feeling the, the bicep, the elbow, the tricep, <clears throat> the forearm, the wrist, the palm, the fingers, all the way down to the fingertips. Noticing temperature, discomfort, and anything else. There might be some tingling happening as well. And we'll go back up this arm and then down the other arm. Same thing. The shoulder, the bicep, tricep, forearm, wrist, palm, and the fingers aware of all the various muscle groups and allowing each of the muscle groups to become just very soft and loose and relaxed. We're not trying to make these things happen. We're simply allowing them to happen, okay? And going back up this arm, around the neck, very nice and gently, 
around the neck and the jawline, the back of the head, around the front, your, your cheeks and your nose and your eyes. On the back again, just kind of swirling up the body, up, up, higher and higher, becoming more relaxed and more relaxed until finally you've reached the crown of your head. And you can kind of go back through the rest of the body. And we're speaking about the anger. Remember that intense emotion. I'd like you to notice where along the way, along that spiraling upward trajectory, you felt any kind of differentiation between <clears throat> like emotional states. Uh, often like the anger can live in in the chest or in the arms. In fact, I've got a little uh, uh, picture I could share in a moment with, uh, which depicts where various, uh, how the temperature lives in the body at various emotional states. Um, and yeah, I'd be more than happy to share that in a moment, but uh, in particular, again, how it sits in you. And once you have that information, just knowing where it sits, just being able to identify that can, or the dial we just did, can turn down the temperature just a little bit. And that will give you enough space. It's not going to cure the systematic oppression that we spoke of and the history of all that crap that we were fed for whatever reason, for better, for worse. It's not going to cure that, but it comes back to us and allows us to calm our body down just enough to manage that, to regulate these intense emotions, in particular anger, because that does have a significant impact on our on our health and well-being. Wonderful. Thank you for helping us to manage some of that anger that comes up. It happens to all of us, actually, um, as long as we're human beings, we experience that, that emotion. It's natural and normal. So thank you, Paul, for giving us some guidance on that. That's absolutely helpful. Um, looks like we do have a few other questions as well. And I wanted to take a moment to thank somebody, um, Serenity, uh, yeah. Sharon, who talked about a a three minute movie that she put a link to in here um, as one way to, to help. Um, and I was curious, Paul, if you could share a couple more of your, your techniques, because that's one of the most powerful tools that you bring to us is this whole book full of experiential activities. And yeah. I personally like these a lot because I think it helps to bring us back into our bodies and right into the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another one that I like uh, <clears throat> is from dialectical behavioral therapy. And actually, I think they caught, they got it from uh, Buddhist uh, practices of like Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield. Um, it's called the wise mind, and it's it's a way of, uh, it's a means of helping you find the balanced sense of self, the balanced like activist that we all have within. How we define it in whatever way you uh, create activism in your life. There's no one right way to do it, and we all need to access that wise mind. In fact, when I'm doing <clears throat> when I'm using like clinical hypnosis is one of my uh, uh, techniques that I'm uh, well versed in. Getting to the wise mind is a matter of going to the the subconscious part of ourselves that where the wise mind, where the intuition lives, and it's really just the the sense of uh, like the the anger and on all that stuff that's uh it's in the conscious mind, the one that helps us like deal with day to day stuff. It's also very judgmental of ourselves and others. <laughs> So once we get in touch with the wise mind, the clearer things become. So the steps in using the wise mind practice are accessing like a mindful logic. And that means understanding the situation in a very analytical, just, just the facts and only the facts. And you're going to use that, your ability to 
um, to step back from the emotional state. And again, that's that's where the grounding comes in. Um, so that when you have that additional clarity and, and safety in your body, you can find the voice that uh, that can weigh the evidence for and again for and against the reality of what you're experiencing. And once you do that, you can uh, experience like the like the echo of the heart, and that's where you take a deep dive into into the wellspring of your emotions. So it's not all about the it's not all about the left or the right brain. We're trying to find that balanced place that we I spoke of. So when you dive into the wellspring of your emotions, <clears throat> this is what fuels your activism, and you can use it to move you forward with uh, with compassion, uh, and you can embrace those emotions and let them inform you of your moves, but not dictate your moves. So, so once we recognize the facts, we can see the emotions, and neither, neither one of those are dictating one way or another, or uh, challenging the reality of, of that perception, because we've all got our own filters. And in doing this, we take away, uh, we go to the third step, and that's harmonizing the head, and the heart. This is where we kind of, again, use the mind, envision maybe like a dance, a dance where the logic and emotion have a beautiful, uh, like a twirl together, gracefully moving together. And this is where the wise mind lives. This is where we gain access to the wise mind. And it's almost a sanctuary where the heartfelt passion and the clear thought merge as one and become uh, in harmony. And then we look at uh, the nudge, like the, the gentle nudge that happens in our gut, which is kind of uh, like the intuition. And sometimes after all this analysis and soul searching through the emotions, it's that gentle nudge that's like, okay, yeah, this feels like the way to go. And you can trust that really trust it as a guide after we've gone through this process of accessing the wise mind. And then it's time to make the, the decision. So when you're in this newfound place of balance, that's when you make a move. And it's one that resonates with your advocacy's spirit and your personal boundaries. Finally, embrace the journey. Embracing the journey, remembering every step you've taken, every misstep that has happened, every graceful pirouette as part of your dance. And you greet them all. You greet every single step along the way with self-compassion, with understanding and patience, just like you would speaking to like your own inner child with understanding patience, and compassion. So by using like the wise mind technique, you can better be equipped to handle these, handle these moments. Yeah. Well, that is wonderful. Thank you so much for that really helpful tool. And that might um, be the response to this other question that we have, um, which is about how to improve concentration, focus, and to avoid mind, mind wandering, uh, distraction, mm -hmm. and to gain better clarity instead of having um, some cognitive dis dysfunction that, and improve communications. And some of these might relate to being misunderstood for our, for our values and... Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> That's why I'd like to introduce the practices of mindfulness. Because it's only, it's not until we can get touch with ourselves and the present moment that we can like act with, uh, with clarity. Uh, in this instance, I would like to describe mindful walking. Uh, mindful walking or if, for whatever, for any other reason, you you don't have the ability to walk or or pirouette or whatever, <laughs> um, mindfully moving. So, 
So I'm just kind of continuing with the, the mindful walking. Um, that's essentially kind of starting out, finding, let's say, I don't know, you just kind of go outside your property and you want to walk uh, to the corner and back. Or from, from your car to the entrance of a uh, doctor's office or cafe. Obviously, all these places are going to be vegan, right? Um, and uh, so you're starting. Um, you're going to find your, your central place. You're going to just feel really balanced on your feet. Just notice how your shoes feel on your feet. And uh, just focus on what that's like to be to be present. Notice, again, using the five senses we did earlier, using your five senses to tune into your environment. The sight, the sound, the smell, the taste, and the touch, the textures. And one foot after another, once you find yourself grounded in the place where you are, standing there quietly, just ready to move forward. And by the way, all these things can be done in, uh, in a matter of seconds. So walking you through, standing there quietly, uh, and you're ready to move forward. So just standing tall, ready to step forward, take a nice, long, deep breath, and just remind yourself that you're right here, right now, you are safe, and you're not in yesterday's to-do list. To-do list, you're not in tomorrow's, like the weather forecast or whatever, maybe activism that you have to do later tonight or next week. You're right here, right now. Once you get there, begin walking. And each step is like, a very mindful practice of one foot after the other and paying particular attention to how how your weight shifts from one foot to the next and how your body feels as you step forward. And maybe, maybe initially we'll feel a little bit off balance. Maybe we'll have some discomfort in a hip or in a shoulder. And then we're just aware of that, just like with the body scan we did. Uh, we're not trying to change that. We're just bringing awareness to it. And then the next step, just breathing in naturally and effortlessly. Maybe there'll be some minor uh, discomfort with the breathing. Again, just one more thing to be aware of. One foot after the other. It's like um, Thich Nhat Hanh actually called mindful walking. It's like walk as if your feet are kissing the earth. And I, I love that description. And by the way, if you haven't already checked him out, you're welcome. Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, sadly, he passed away a few years ago. But um, yeah, again, like I said, with the five senses, tap it in. And these are things you're going to be aware of with each step along the way between you, uh, between your starting point and that vegan cafe or grocery store or wherever you're going or the corner and back. Always tuned into your immediate surroundings, feeling safe. Uh, and I'm going to infuse some gratitude in whatever way you're able to move. Maybe you have some mobility move, uh, mobility, mobility, mobility issues or constant chronic pain in, in a knee, for example. And that's probably not going to change over the course of a two minute walk or, uh, but you're aware of it and that's going to be a limitation. You just listen to the body and you adjust as you go along. And you continue to breathe and feel gratitude for your ability to move in whatever way is meaningful for you right now. <clears throat> gratitude, because each step becomes, like I said, kissing the earth, feeling thankful. And for each breath you can take, for each step you can make. And continuing the breathing, coordinate the breathing, like with your steps, you could step forward and breathe out. So let's see, you would, you'd step, breathe in for the count of like three, and then step with your left foot and breathe out for three. Step again, breathe in for three, whatever you count uh, is comfortable for you. You can absolutely do that. Um, but it's just a matter of finding this simple, very cyclical, cyclical and endlessly beautiful, movement forward with gratitude, with some grace, right? Not graceful, okay? 
maybe graceful. <laughs> um, and then continuing and just kind of let go. There's going to be thoughts. As of course, yesterday's to-do list maybe had, maybe wasn't finished or even compiled. And uh, whatever uh, activities you have later today or tomorrow or next week, they're going to come at you. And that's when each time you notice that, you just kind of you know, wave them off like you would... <clears throat> Uh, like in a waltz, if anyone has, has waltz, it's like you feel them, you just use that energy and momentum to continue moving forward. You don't let them kind of knock you to the ground, especially not to the point where you are, are uh, like collapsed to the ground and not able to move any further. Uh, it's just like, again, gracefully using that energy to move and dance with because those thoughts, those feelings are going to keep coming. But the more you can bring yourself back to center, and the present, your five senses, the feelings, the gratitude, the easier it's going to be for you to, to make it those to for that three-minute walk. And then finally, don't don't worry about what anyone else thinks when you're walking very, very slowly. Um, I've had my share of uh, odd looks. And honestly, they're probably just jealous that they can't move as gracefully as me. So... Letting go of that, because this dance, this mindful walk is yours. It's yours to feel joyous, to feel an intimate connection with your body. And embrace, just kind of embrace the, the sheer thrill of being in this moment, this wondrous ability to breathe, to laugh, to move right here, right now as it is just a step-by-step -step process. And there are plenty of ways to be mindful throughout your life, throughout your day, whether it's walking, doing dishes, vacuuming, whatever it is, fully focused on the, on the task at hand, completely present, and you'll get through the next moment, and then the next, and the next. Well, it's so helpful to have that awareness of each moment and how that brings us into the present and helps to ground us um, and be more focused in our mind. So, Dr. Paul, are there any other um, techniques that you might want to share with us before we close today? Or if anyone has any questions, I know we um, had a question um, Janine, I know you had a question earlier. I don't know if we answered it already. If not, you're welcome to, to share it with us. Um, or if anyone else who's joined us today has, a, has another question. So there's an interesting chat uh, going on about different types of activism. Sometimes we oh, think of yeah. activism as looking one way, but actually it may look various ways. I don't know. Dr. Paul, if you have anything to say about that or an activity that relates. Around uh, activism specifically? Well, perhaps we judge ourselves about our different types of activism and, and what is true more valuable or worthy um, when actually all of them have their place in our movement. Yeah. Um, so I've got... Uh... I can actually share a thought of that. And actually, this is something that's in the, in my compilation of questions. Um, it's a practice. I know it was introduced to me by Tara Brock. Uh, it's called RAIN. It's an acronym. It stands for Recognize, Allow, Investigate, and Non-Identification. And, and this is a practice that helps us get closer to a sense of self-compassion around like that self-judgment. And it really does sink in there. And like I was saying earlier, that's about the conscious mind really um, trying to dictate what the thoughts and feelings are based on. Well, they're on the front lines, and I'm just here making the best choices I can with what's on my with you know with what's on my plate. So I'm just not doing good enough. Like, well, all right, okay, let's breathe. Remember that. <laughs> Remember breathing and grounding. Excellent starting point. So when it comes to the, the practice of, of RAIN, so the R is recognizing. 
And that's when you begin your journey inward. Again, a grounding practice where you can notice your present thoughts, your emotions and sensations and feeling a sense of, uh, if you're feeling a sense of like disconnect or judgment about, uh, about your values or your level of activism, just to acknowledge and honor that particular emotion. Validate the uh, experience that you're having, the emotion that you're having. It's it could be judgmental, it could be fear. That's a that's a base emotion underlying so much of what we experience in the intense range. But um, just accept and acknowledge that the emotion is present. Just acknowledge it, honor that the emotion is present. And that's the recognition of rain. The A is allow. So in the, in the ebb and flow of life, sometimes, sometimes resistance arises. So <clears throat> instead, instead of resisting, grant your emotions the space to breathe. Just allow them to be there. Envision them like, like waves or like leaves that are floating down a serene river, just present for a moment and then drifting right on by. They're not going to um, stick around very long. They're just, you're just going to allow them to be there. The I is investigate. Now with a warm heart of compassion, like even bringing up imagery of the most compassionate person or healer that you that you know or would like to experience trying to try to channel some of what what they've got um and so with that warm heart of compassion you're going to dive a little deeper and you're simply going to ponder on questions like why do i feel this way or what exactly stirred these feelings Granted, this isn't about overanalyzing, uh, but, but just softly connecting to your own experience, just really understanding the greater context as to what brought you here, exactly why you're feeling this way, what triggered these feelings. And then we move on to N, which is non-identification, or in Buddhist parlance, parlance that would be non-attachment, right? And just remember that you are a vast, you are a valid human being. Your feelings, however intense, are just transient visitors. And by releasing your identification with them, you embrace your expansive nature well beyond the fleeting emotions. I think I mentioned this earlier about the, the thoughts that we have you don't have to believe those thoughts. You don't have to follow them to their seemingly inevitable conclusion. And the feelings that you have, you don't have to believe those. They're yours. They're valid. But they're also filtered through various experiences. And that's why we bring ourselves to a grounded place, accessing the wise mind, and releasing our attachment to them, attachment to labels, and knowing that today, maybe it is making a choice about what's on our plate. Perhaps next week, you might be on the front lines. Maybe you'll never be on the front lines. But who's to say that that's, that's wrong? That's, you, you're not an activist if unless you're doing those things, unless you're in the midst of that. And this is where uh, like boundaries comes in. Uh, so which is a whole other topic and well worthy of exploration, but yeah, very crucial in understanding how to get onto one moment to the next and enlist, allow yourself to be enveloped and channel the practices of self-compassion. Nice. Well, thank you so much for sharing this other practice, the RAIN practice. And again, anyone who's interested, you can find these, all of these techniques in uh, Dr. Paul's 
FAQ book, and you can access that from our Activist Appreciation Month webpage, which is at idausa.org forward slash activist month. So you can find it there. And probably, um, Dr. Paul, you may have that on your website as well. Yeah. Um, can we put it in the, in the chat or something or just kind of let them sure, find it? Sure, sure. Yeah, or you can say the, the link. It's oh, yeah, the therapy. website is holisticvegantherapy.com. And I'll put that in there in case uh, the book is, is just, oops. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And I just want to take a moment and thank everybody who has joined us today for this um, wonderful workshop and presentation by Dr. Paul White. I've learned so much. I really enjoy these experiential tools, and I think they're so helpful for us on many different levels. And I wanted to thank everyone who, who took time today to um, gather together, to um, explore some of these practices, and also to Dr. Paul. We appreciate you for activist appreciation. I mean, this time flew by. There's so much more that I'd love to share, uh, but uh, there's time for that. Yes, and you can find some of these tips on In Defense of Animals social media. We're going to be showcasing some video clips uh, by Dr. Paul, so you can get some more tips there. And also, please do check out his ebook, and that is linked on the uh, Activist Month page and also linked here in our Zoom chat. And we hope that you uh, get, a, get a chance to practice these uh, during the month and also ongoing to help. Um, ease your mind and help empower you for all of your different types of activism. Well, it's definitely been a pleasure and we hope to see yeah. you for some of our future activism programs. And we do record all of these and we have a playlist that's on the In Defense of Animals YouTube where you can find all of the Activist Appreciation Month programs. And this one will be up shortly as well. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for taking you. time with us today. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, everyone. It's, uh, I love the back and forth and um, <clears throat> experiential experiential component of, of doing these little workshops and uh, seminars. I uh, just can't get enough of it. And obviously without people like uh, everyone here and definitely passionate about these things. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you at the next program. And um, yes, many blessings to you and all of your work and, and staying grounded in who you really are. We appreciate you. Take care. Goodbye, everyone.